Welcome back to IdeaGen's UK Global Goals 2030 Summit. Today's power panel continues with Mark Fitzgerald, principal in KPMG's International Development Services, together with Laura Frigenti, global head of KPMG's International Development Assistance Services Institute. Welcome. Thank you, George, and appreciate the opportunity. Um, so Laura is a colleague, good friend, uh, and I can't think of anyone better equipped to have this discussion around the impact of COVID and coronavirus on the SDG agenda. Uh, Lara has many, many uh, years experience with uh, in large institutions like the World Bank. Uh, she also led the Italian Development Agency before joining KPMG. And she leads our, our basic the, our uh, international development think tank uh, out of DC. So with you today, you have two Europeans based in DC, but with global mandates. Um, so we are excited to have this discussion. Uh, Laura, I've noted in the press in the last couple of weeks, and particularly when I look at uh, statements from the UN Secretary General around just broader considerations of how the coronavirus and the response of member states to the coronavirus, particularly in the financing and the funding uh, therein, how that is potentially impacting the uh, agenda for the sustainable development goals. Um, and his plea was that it should be additive and not duplicating uh, those finance uh, flows with respect to the SDG agenda. So I thought uh, we would spend the next 10, 15 minutes or so kind of exploring that uh, and teasing that issue out, uh, understanding where the world had got to uh, prior to the onset of the coronavirus, uh, where it is now a couple of months into that issue. Uh, and then, of course, what does the picture look like going forward and who are the key actors in relation to this response and this discussion? So, so with that, uh, why don't we dive straight in? Um, maybe we can level set and kind of go back a couple of months if we can, uh, and almost uh, you know wipe our memories uh, of the last kind of three or four months. Where was the world with respect to the STG agenda? Let's say in January of this year. You know, how was that progressing? What were the key issues at play? And particularly in this year, with, which is the 75th anniversary of the UN, UN General Assembly coming up in September, there was going to be a clear reflection uh, on that agenda. Uh, 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 towards the 2030 uh, timeline for the SDG framework. So what was your view of where we were at that point? Uh, and we can kind of level set there and, we'll, and then we'll go on from that. Thank you, Mark. Um, I'm very happy to be here and have this conversation that I feel is particularly timing now as we are all learning about the impact of COVID, which has actually not been fully estimated as yet. I would say that the last time that the world in its totality uh, took stock of where we were in the implementation of the Agenda 2030 was during the last uh, United Nations General Assembly in September 2019. And at that point, unfortunately, the picture wasn't particularly pretty in a sense that while there was a clear acknowledgement that many countries have made progress, particularly, uh, I would say, on the reduction of global poverty, extreme poverty, et cetera, et cetera, I think that the one point that emerged very clearly is that there wasn't one single country, including uh, the more mature economies uh, in Europe or in the United States, for example, that were actually on track to achieve in full the whole set of uh, you know, goals and objectives. And I think that that was mainly the results of different factors that of course vary for different countries. Many uh, countries of course had issues related to the implementation capacity, uh, particularly the low income countries, fragile states or lower middle income countries uh, that do not have really structures in place that allow for a massive ramping up of activities as the Agenda 2030 was requiring. Uh, in many cases, the issue was related to the lack of funding. And I think that you may remember that the uh, Addis Ababa Finance for Development meeting, which was the one that agreed the financing framework for the Agenda 2030, 
was uh, basically stating that there were three main um, filiers, I would say, of funding. There was the public uh, development assistance funding, the more traditional funding, that was supposed to uh, expand, and there was this very stern invitation to all countries to ramp up their ODAs to the point 0 0.7 uh, level, uh, 0 0.7 of GDP level that, uh, you know, had been, uh, you know, expected for quite some time. And what we have seen is that no country actually went anywhere close to that level, with the exception of the United Kingdom. Um, you, uh, the second filiere was the one of the private sector. And I feel that, unfortunately, that is the one that uh, has been more difficult uh, to materialize, not because there wasn't interest on the side of the private sector that actually has shown great interest and great sensitivity uh, to this point, but that it was very difficult for organizations that move on a different structure with a different business model, with different set of objectives, to actually be able to align their resources to more public, global public goods type of objective. And then the third one that has also been disappointing was increasing the domestic uh, resource mobilization through strengthening fiscal mechanism, etc., etc., and that has also unfortunately not materialized. So it was a combination of factors that all together uh, indicated that uh, 10 years um, away from, uh, you know, that deadline of the 2030 that mm. the world in its totality was pretty much lagging behind in the implementation of the SDGs. So with that context, Lara, um, you know, and I think that realization was well understood uh, and discussed <laughs> at length uh, over the last 12 months. Uh, how do you feel that picture has changed uh, with the onset of coronavirus uh, and the immediate response that the world has had to grapple with? Well, uh, I would say that we don't have the full picture yet, uh, in a sense that we haven't really seen the full impact, nor have we seen what type of uh, you know, economic crisis uh, is going to derive from the coronavirus, whether it is going to be uh, a V-shaped, so steep decline, but very quick recovery, which of course will bring some scenarios, or whether it's going to be more of a U-shape and hopefully not an L-shape with a very long stagnation period. But what I'm saying is that clearly what we have seen are two important elements. The first one that we, uh, many of the gains uh, that were made in reducing poverty, in bringing people above the poverty line and more towards the middle class, uh, unfortunately, uh, you know, will probably be lost. Uh, we don't know for how long, but definitely they are lost at the moment. If you just think about the United, the United States with 30 million, uh, you know, more unemployed people in the past three weeks, I mean, this is all uh, a big burden uh, for governments to support. Uh, in Europe, the situation is different because uh, they have better uh, social assistance and social security systems in place. So for the moment, a lot of the people who lost their jobs are being sustained by the government. But how long will that, uh, you know, be possible? That's a big question mark. So I would say that the first thing that we have seen is that the national attention, particularly of the largest, uh, you know, donors has gone now on their domestic problem. So the allocation of their resources, their attention to, uh, you know, problems like climate change, et cetera, et cetera, has now been diverted to doing whatever they can to limit the impact of this, of this emergency. That, of course, is not promising um, in, uh, in terms of, you know, achieving the objective of the Agenda 2030. But I also want to, uh, I would say, to put a positive spin because uh, one of the things that has clearly emerged is that some of the areas that have emerged as critical uh, in this crisis are areas that, uh, you know, were highlighted as central and critical for the Agenda 2030. And I'm thinking about, uh, you know, the achievement of universal health care for all. I think that uh, very few people after this crisis would uh, probably, uh, you know, argue that uh, there are some public aspects of healthcare uh, 
that go beyond the ability of individuals to have to pay for their own cost, but that the ability of not the, the lack of that ability has some public implications that clearly, uh, you know, have enormous cost, uh, you know, for government, states, and communities. So I think that there will be a different willingness to engage at least on the policy element of some of the points that were very much at the core. And I think about the same can be said for uh, social security, social assistance, and the presence of safety net. What we have seen in the big difference uh, between, uh, you know, countries is that those countries like uh, in Europe that had a very well developed system of safety net and social protection for the citizens were much faster in ramping up the response because they definitely uh, had simply to scale up mechanisms that were already in place. So I think that there are also some positive elements, if I may use the adjective positive in the midst of this crisis. Mm -hmm. No, thank you, Lauren. So, so in essence, uh, there's a couple of considerations going on here. You know, some may look at it quite simply that there might be a, a binary uh, discussion that uh, we're going to divert resources and attention to, to COVID exclusively to the exclusion of the SDG agenda, uh, either within their own country or through their uh, foreign aid programs. Um, but the other potential consideration is how much of an interface there is between the SDG agenda and the COVID response. Um, and can you kind of tease that out a little bit for us in terms of, you know, by doing, uh, supporting one element, uh, either the SDG framework or, or a specific goal, you are in inherently supporting uh, the COVID response in, in whatever phase it may apply or vice versa. You mentioned about universal health care. You mentioned about, uh, you know, just access to uh, health capacity and, and systems. There's probably elements of education uh, and awareness building that is built into that. There's capacity building of institutions, etc., all of which are inherently uh, included in the SDG uh, targets and goals. Um, so how, how would you view that uh, kind of consideration in the very short term? And do you see that evolving uh, in a natural way, or is it going to be something that ha will have to be forced by national governments and inter international organizations like the UN? Well, I think that, you know, I, um, I'm an optimist, and I think that one cannot be in the development business without being an optimist and hoping that, uh, you know, you are on a positive trajectory. So let me take this pin. But uh, I feel that there is a, actually, uh, that, that there, is, there are several good uh, windows of opportunities uh, for changing some of the things that before the crisis were not really working uh, perfectly. And I think that we also have to continue, uh, you know, remind ourselves that as much as now that we are under the lockdown, all that we had before February was fantastic. In reality, it wasn't. Uh, it was a world that, uh, you know, as we said, wasn't uh, necessarily uh, balanced in terms of, you know, equity, uh, where there were big issues of redistribution, where the climate change agenda wasn't functioning very well. But I just want to give one example of, of something where I really think that there is an opportunity and it's related to climate change. So governments are going to have to uh, you know, take uh, lots of stakes and lots of equities in uh, all sorts of private sector, uh, you know, enterprises, uh, because of the nature of of this crisis and the needs for restarting the production. Now they can just do that simply, uh, you know, passing uh, resources and making sure that the business gets back on their feet, or they can actually uh, apply some, I don't want to say conditionality because it's a word that has a kind of a tarnished definition, but I would say some uh, stern recommendations to the private sector that there is time for, you know, changing the way in which, uh, you know, they factor the climate related risks uh, in their business model. Uh, and also that, you know, there, there are also opportunities for them to rethink uh, the way in which, uh, for example, jobs are defined as uh, good jobs or decent jobs uh, for the people who work for them. So what I'm saying is that this very strong and prominent role that governments are having much more so than they probably had before the crisis, because they are the distributor 
of a pretty large uh, package of resources in different dimensions, actually give government the opportunities of being the inspirator or inspirer of uh, you know good uh, policies and have uh, discussions with private sectors on things that maybe government weren't particularly eager uh, to engage before. And all this goes in the direction of the SDGs and the Agenda 2030 that ultimately wanted to have uh, places where there were more opportunities for people, where uh, you know the climate related risks were factored in uh, in a much sterner way than they had before, uh, where access to basic social services was part of, uh, you know, the, how can I say, the endowment of each and every individual, uh, where there was a respect for, uh, you know, the environment and so on and so forth. So I'm thinking that uh, the moment that we will go past this initial shock, because the one thing that has also been dramatic about this crisis has been the, the incredible speed. I think that government mm -hmm. really didn't have much time to do their thinking or to be advised uh, in the right direction. And it's pretty miraculous uh, what I would say across the board, uh, different countries have done under circumstances that are so complex. But the moment that we will move from the acute phase to what I call phase two, so that gray area between the new normal and where we are now, uh, I think that there will really be space for governments to be promoting uh, a lot of attention to good policies, to good practices that will lead the world much faster towards the SDGs than we would have been otherwise. Thank you, Lara. Obviously, governments will take the lead as they have been doing so in, in the COVID response. Um, and as we progress through the various phases, which are well established now, if yet uncertain in terms of their timing. And of course, there'll be variability around how those phases will uh, impact various countries, uh, depending where they are geographically. Um, but one thing I'd like to end on is the role of the private sector. Uh, you've touched on various aspects of that uh, in the last uh, few minutes with respect to how uh, private sector will respond to government policy, uh, how they're taking uh, you know, a leadership role in terms of uh, innovation uh, and you know, access to, to markets, etc. Uh, there's clearly a huge interest of the private sector around the economic fallout, but also they have employees that will have to deal with the health and the social uh, consequences uh, of COVID, all of which uh, clearly plays a role with the STG agenda. So meshing all of that together, uh, if you could kind of see a path or a role for the private sector um, over the next six to 12 months, uh, not just with respect to its clear involvement uh, in dealing with the COVID response, uh, but how that can then overlap and translate into progress uh, with the SDG agenda. How do, how do you see that uh, playing out? Well, I think that the private sector is going to be um, the great player because in a way, uh, you know, while the government will define the, the broad parameters, then the private sector will be the implementer of the recovery phase. The vast majority of the resources that you will see in all, that we are seeing in all this stimulus package are directed to the private sector. So what I expect is mainly two things. I mean, the first one I would expect, because the map of poverty has shifted so dramatically in such a, um, a very short uh, period of time. So I wasn't until February expecting the private sector, for example, in Europe or in the United States, to focus a lot uh, on their own domestic uh, poverty. But I think that now the numbers will be growing uh, in those countries. And so it's really important that you know, the private sector take the lead in stabilizing those economies, and that is natural before they start thinking about emerging markets. I think that it will call, uh, in general, there will be a call for a more responsible approach to use of resources and dealing with a business model and a different model of productivity, uh, also in emerging market where the private sector, if I may say so, has uh, not always shown uh, the right level of corporate uh, social responsibility. I would say that all issues related to the security of the employments, not only the employers, not only from the point of view of the health, 
uh, dimensions, but also uh, in terms of, you know, for example, having sick leaves, uh, having uh, access to a uh, type of social assistance benefits, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, that are debated in countries that have a more like market-oriented approach to, uh, you know, employee-employer relation. I think that that will need to be revisited. Um, I would say also that the model of access to health insurance or health services, which is a debate that the world has been uh, thinking a lot about and that cannot be resolved without having the private sector um, sitting at the table, uh, but with a different spirit, not just with the spirit of looking for the cheapest package, but with the spirit of protecting, uh, you know, as much as possible the workers, all that, uh, you know, will also see a very strong role of the private sector. And uh, the climate agenda, I feel that is also something that is going to be brought back again uh, to the forefront of the discussion. So I do expect that the private sector will do what, in a way, 15 years ago, the Agenda 2030 was expecting the private sector to do. So to be a strong player in the development of ideas, in the development of approaches, and of course, I mean, in uh, um, finding different models for sharing the profits of the work uh, across society. And I think that the sense of responsibility that, uh, you know, private sector has shown uh, in many cases during this crisis I, I like to believe that will remain uh, in a different way of thinking about redistribution of profits and what the definition of profit is uh, for private sector companies. Yeah, thank you, Laura. It, it's become clear, I think, to many observers that the uh, the more traditional view of citizenship or CSR or being a good corporate player ha has evolved significantly over the last five or ten years. Um, you know, there's still very uh, very solid programs around uh, volunteering, um, around financial support the private sector companies provide to nonprofits or other. Uh, 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 entities the, in the various markets. Um, but what you're hinting at is an integration of these more social issues into the core business strategies uh, of these private sector entities. And also for those entities to then apply their skills, uh, their supply chains, their uh, expertise, their geographic spread to those social issues because it's inherently useful uh, and integrated with their business model. Um, and I think that was clearly an intent uh, of the 2030 agenda. Uh, and we're seeing that play out uh, in front of our eyes, quite frankly, with the Corona uh, virus response. So with that sense of optimism, I appreciate uh, you being an optimist, Lara. Uh, thank you very much for your in-depth comments. Uh, always a pleasure. Um, and with that, hand back to George. just completed on today's idea gen uk global goals 2030 digital summit presented globally by microsoft powered by azure we are uh, at a tipping point i think for for cross-sector collaboration and i think it was music to my ears to hear you all discussing the importance of not only the role of government but also the role of companies and how the social strategies are now really have accelerated as a result of this global issue that we're facing literally a, a unthinkable a few months ago. And here we are, uh, but yet we still have the global goals to achieve by 2030. Companies that are resilient, that were resilient, that had a resilient social strategy in their business model are able to help today in ways that were unthinkable even a few months ago. And so I think the lessons that you all describe are really something that most companies can look at now to say, how do we rethink, how do we rethink the model? And how do we rethink the strategy in order to create that resilient model that is synergistic and able to thrive in, in difficult circumstances as we're facing today? You've seen time and time again, all of the collaboration taking place I think governments realize they can't do it alone. I think companies can't do it alone. And ultimately, in order to achieve the global goals, with your help and assistance for so many companies across the planet in navigating 
these social strategies, I think we'll be in a better place in 2030 and achieve the global goals. Thank you both so very much. Thank you. Thank you.